Um, so yeah, everyone, welcome back to our session on global vaccination context and different approaches. Um, our next um, talk is going to be given by two speakers, Caroline uh, Wagner and Mac Lang from Ohio State University. And they're going to be talking about scientific cooperation and vaccine distribution by China around the COVID-19 crisis. Hi, thank you everyone. Let me just share my screen here so we can get started. Uh, I'm Caroline Wagner. I'm a professor at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University and I'm joined today by Mac Lang, who is an eminent scholar, uh, undergraduate student here at our John Glenn College of Public Affairs and he is doing his undergraduate honors thesis uh, on um, vaccine diplomacy. We were super thrilled to have this opportunity to talk to you uh, about this work uh, that we've been doing. So uh, we're going to take a slightly um, two-part approach to it. My work has been focused on China's collaboration on coronavirus research uh, at the global level. And I've been, uh, I'll present uh, a little bit on that. And then Mac will take over and talk about um, China's actions in distributing uh, the vaccine, the results of a number of these uh, research activities. So let's just jump in. Uh, so we, we began this work um, partly out of uh, my own research on China's rise as a scientific power in the world. And then coronavirus gave us a very unique opportunity to do kind of a, a natural experiment on the nature of collaboration in time of crisis. So uh, we started out with just the initial observation that Chinese researchers um, engage in international collaboration in research and development, and they're very actively engaged um, in part to enhance their national strength, to accumulate knowledge, as well as to make contributions, of course, at the global level. And then when uh, Mac and I started working together, uh, we began um, to test two hypotheses. One is that the Chinese vaccine companies um, begin, of course, with a scientific uh, mission to create a, a workable vaccine, an acceptable vaccine, uh, and then over time become more of an arm of the state uh, in, in a sort of diplomatic way in dispensing vaccines. And then the second hypothesis is that um, vaccine distribution at this time is motivated uh, by political and economic goals rather than by scientific or humanitarian connections. And um, we do have some evidence um, to share with you about that. Hold on, let me. Oh, sorry, sorry, I went too far. Okay, so um, just a, a, a brief recap to give us an idea of where we are on the landscape. Um, China has made, um, you know, just a spectacular rise uh, in global scientific output over the last 20 years. I think we're all very much aware of that. Um, this is data that I developed together with Lute Leidesdorf, in which we just looked at the world share of publications uh, by nation or uh, regional group. In this case, we have the European Union, the United States, and China from 2001 until 2000, close to 2020. Uh, although the latter years are, were a projection at the time we put the graph together. But uh, I think what you can see is when we look at world share of publications, the United States is going down as a share of publications. So this is a relative share, not, um, not the uh, gross count. If we looked at gross count, uh, the United States, um, uh, the European Union outpaces the United States in gross count still. Um, but this is only relative share of all publications. And so we see the the pie itself has gotten larger uh, and the share to the United States is going down. The share to the European Union is going down a little more slowly because of the rate of growth of the, United, of the European Union, right? They've added more countries and therefore more people. Uh, and they have a gross number uh, of more scientists and engineers publishing than the United States. Uh, of note is the, the rise in China. So we see from, uh, if we were to extend even further back in time, China coming from next to nothing to by 2020 surpassing the United States in gross outputs of scientific publications. So when we looked at the coronavirus, as I mentioned, um, 
COVID gave us a very interesting natural experiment to see what happens to collaboration at the international level in a time of crisis. Uh, and one of the motivating factors in looking at this was the political statements um, by some that China wasn't cooperating in COVID research, early COVID research. And we found quite the opposite, that in the earliest days, China produced um, in the first uh, three months, 35% of all articles on coronavirus related research up from their pre-pandemic level. So in other words, um, the publication numbers coming out of China in the earliest days were actually uh, higher than their work on coronavirus before the pandemic. Um, and then the, then uh, we also found that Chinese authors collaborated very actively in the early days with the United States and the United Kingdom. They issued the earliest uh, work and those early publications first by China with the genomic, um, uh, public, the initial genomic publication and then uh, early works with the United States and the United Kingdom um, make up pretty much 60% of all work that came out on COVID uh, in um, the first six months of research. The Chinese articles on COVID are the most highly cited. I think they're one, two, and three in COVID uh, high citations. Uh, however, what we do see is over 2020, China's work on COVID drops off across the year. Um, and that's in um, contrast to the United States and European Union, where we see their work increasing in number. And we found a mix of kind of political issues on one hand um, from, uh, from the, the Chinese side, as well as from the, uh, the US and the European side, uh, having an influence on that. But also we noticed that um, the numbers of publications in almost all countries uh, correlated with the disease occurrence. So as disease numbers went up, publications went up. As disease numbers dropped, publications went down. Uh, we can't really explain that, but we did find that um, for uh, COVID-related publications. So of, I'm um, sorry, I'm having trouble here. Um, so of China's published scholarship on vaccines, as I mentioned, the very early work, 80% led by China, uh, of the work that was coming out, 62% of their work from China was uh, sole authored from within China and 38% were international collaborations. I'll explain the asterisk in a second. 83% uh, of their works were academic uh, and or hospital oriented uh, or originating in an academic setting or hospital setting. And then 15% included business partners. Um, the USA was the most frequent partner with China followed by the UK. The asterisks are because uh, the 38% international collaborations is higher than expected. China's international collaborations are usually about 25%. And then 15% including business is higher than expected. Usually it's about 10%. So we do see uh, a change in the patterns of um, collaborative research uh, in general and around the vaccine uh, in particular. So um, in order to take a look at then uh, what happens to the vaccine distribution patterns, um, we began with a case study method and a survey of activity um, to identify what's happening in um, China's decisions regarding the vaccines uh, that were produced by four kind of companies in China. And uh, Mac Lang uh, will take over at this point. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, background. If you could go to the next slide, perfect. Um, the maps here you can see on the left is all countries that have received doses of a Chinese manufactured vaccine. Um, it's shaded to indicate how many, but the, the biggest takeaway here is that a significant portion of the world, um, especially we see in Africa and South America, um, China has been really active in distributing their vaccine in a way that has not been uh, the case for a lot of the Western vaccines. Um, also of note is that a lot of these doses, while uh, a good deal of them are purchases, negotiated uh, agreements, also a good number of them are donations, uh, especially at a scale not seen with any of the, the Western vaccines. Um, and so within that, we decided to look at three different clusters, so cluster A, B, and C. Um, and we'll explain the grouping for those a little bit on the coming slides, but on the right, you can see kind of geographically 
where they're focused. And if we want to move to the next slide, we can talk about uh, how they were selected. So the first group is Group A, the prior collaborators. Um, these are countries that have a history of uh, collaboration with China. It's Argentina, Bulgaria, Pakistan, and Vietnam. Um, the big outlier in this group probably would be Bulgaria, but uh, because of their European affiliations, but they also have a history of collaboration that we wanted to explore further. One thing that was notable about this group is that their uh, collaboration stems across multiple fields. Um, so this is not solely one type of transaction. This is something that we've identified a long history of collaboration and we would expect this group, if it was purely scientific, uh, these would be their, their first partners that would be involved in vaccine distribution. So the next group uh, is the developing partners or, or potential partners largely. Uh, this is Botswana, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. Uh, these countries have some agreements with China, but they're relatively limited, um, mainly temporally. They are relatively recent. Um, these countries, one thing that we've identified as a potential factor motivating a collaboration is resource support. So for example, in Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, this is one of the world's most concentrated and only supplies of cobalt. Uh, 15 of the 17 cobalt lines in the country are controlled by uh, Chinese companies, and we think that that is an important thing in terms of reciprocity. Uh, Burkina Faso is another really interesting one um, in terms of their interim diplomatic support. So while these have a limited uh, history of agreement, we believe that the in the interim, they try to make gestures of support. So Burkina Faso uh, up until I believe 2018, uh, fairly recently recognized Taiwan, and they have now switched over. Uh, and in the interim, they have received a lot of Chinese support in terms of projects and receiving doses of the vaccine. Um, so this group, we believe, uh, is being targeted because they have showed that they are amenable to investment, and this is something that is largely coming from China, um, and so they're the most natural partner for this group. And then the final group that we looked at is Group C. These are the targets. Uh, so these are countries that are currently not aligned with China, but um, COVID could potentially be a changing factor in that. So it's Guatemala, Honduras, Paraguay, Eritrea, and Malawi. Uh, the big thing to note for this group is there is some geographic and logistical constraints. So obviously with the uh, Latin American countries, this is uh, pretty far from China in terms of collaboration and distribution. Uh, and moreover, in some of the African countries, especially Eritrea, um, there are some big logistical constraints. Eritrea is one of the only countries, along with North Korea, that has not started any vaccination uh, of any dosage from any country. Uh, and a lot of that is due to relatively uh, relative difficulties in getting the vaccine and distributing it within the country. Uh, also, in the Latin American countries, there is a large uh, diplomatic opposition to China. They're all aligned with Taiwan, uh, and they are relatively uh, firm in that stance. Moreover, they're, they're relatively aligned with the United States, um, and that obviously would lead them to be more likely to collaborate with the United States on some of these issues. However, uh, one of the joys of studying in real time is even in the time that we've made this presentation, um, there's been some exciting developments. So although not in this study group, Nicaragua um, would certainly be very similar to some of the Latin American countries. Um, and just last week announced that they were ending their recognition of Taiwan in favor of relations with the PRC, People's Republic of China. Uh, and they just overnight received their first donation of vaccines um, they received 200,000 Chinese made vaccines and it's expected that one of the or believe that one of the factors that led them to switch their allegiance um, was their limited vaccination. We see this in Paraguay too. Uh, in Paraguay there's a big demand for vaccines that is not able to be met through a lot of the western vaccines and so there's some uh, clamoring to get a an agreement with China that's currently not feasible but could be uh, changing shortly. Uh, even in Eritrea, where we mentioned that the infrastructure is an issue, um, in late November, they announced that they were signing on to China's Belt and Road Agreement, their infrastructure agreement. Um, and it's believed that health, health infrastructure uh, will be a big part of that agreement going forward. 
So looking at some of the analysis that we've done on these groups, um, we did find that scientific collaboration is not a major incentive. Um, we found that cooperation is relatively widespread. So in group A nations, this is the group that we would expect to be primarily focused on China, uh, Argentina, Bulgaria, and Vietnam are more likely to cooperate with the USA in biological sciences. Uh, well, worth knowing that Pakistan does work closely with China, but um, it's not a one-way agreement or exclusively or heavily focused on China. Um, so there's a broad influence of international actors. In the group B nation, um, almost all of them work exclusively or almost exclusively with the USA, which is a bit counter to what we expected. Uh, but it makes sense if you think about the limited scope of the historical agreement. Um, a lot of these countries are relatively new to their agreements with China. Um, so as a result, it would make sense that some of the, the scientific cooperation hasn't caught up yet. Uh, and then finally, the Group C nations, the Latin American bloc uh, is very heavily cooperative with the USA, as mentioned, partially due to geographic and partially due to diplomatic constraints. Uh, and Eritrea and Malawi do have some cooperative projects with China, um, largely through the Belt and Road Project. And given some of the recent announcements, it's expected that this might increase. Uh, but taken as a whole, this, this mixed scope indicates that uh, it's not necessarily prior publication or scientific collaboration that is a strong predictor of vaccine receipt at this time. Looking at one of the political factors uh, we considered voting alignment at the United Nations. This is um, one way that is uh, very easy for some of these lower income countries to show support. Um, they might not have as much diplomatic leverage from an economic standpoint, but at the United Nations, every country, uh, their vote counts the same. And China is very active in uh, corralling votes at the United Nations. So if you look across the groups, group C at the top, uh, this has the lowest alignment group or the lowest overall score, which is uh, what we would expect. Eritrea is a bit of an outlier. They um, are maybe closer to a group B, which again makes sense. Um, it maybe suggests that the reason that they aren't receiving vaccines is not as much political, but logistically concerned. In group B, uh, this group has the highest UN alignment score, which again, uh, I think aligns with our theory. Um, this group is in the interim trying to prove support for China by voting uh, in alignment at the United Nations um, while also developing projects. But the UN is a relatively uh, low, low cost way to show support. And then finally, Group A, uh, it's a bit split. Bulgaria brings down the average a little bit, which is somewhat expected due to their EU alignment. Um, but if you look at Pakistan and Vietnam, very high voting alignment. They're, they're some of China's strongest allies. Um, so that would make sense as well. And then looking towards what we can expect going forward, um, this is the vaccination rates by country. Uh, one thing to note too, uh, some of this, like we see Pakistan is relatively low. They're actually the highest uh, of this group, I believe, in terms of absolute doses delivered, delivered. They just have a massive population. So that brings down their rate a little bit. But we can see that in a, in group B, they have very low vaccination rates other than Botswana. Um, so it's expected that they will continue to look to China to receive doses. The majority of the doses that this group has received is from China at this time. Um, same thing with group A. Uh, most of their success has been driven by Chinese vaccines. And then group C, uh, it's important to see if they will continue their trends. They're hovering around 50%, a little bit lower. Um, if they're able to boost those, those rates and, and get more coverage using their available supply, um, they might be able to resist some of the political or diplomatic pressures associated with vaccination. But that'll be something that's really important to watch going forward. So overall, I think that uh, what we're seeing so far is that there are definitely political and diplomatic constraints associated with vaccination. Uh, we believe at this time that uh, there is definitely something uh, motivating this collaboration that is not fully scientific. Um, at the start of the pandemic, the collaboration was largely motivated in this way, but one of the things that is different about the uh, Chinese state-owned companies and some of the Western vaccines 
is that they're a lot more selective in who they're giving the vaccines to in a way that is not fully explained uh, economically. And I think this is important to model and consider in future research. Um, one thing that's great about this conference is working with people across disciplines. And it's important to remember that some of the scientific models can mesh with the policy models. Um, it is very useful and helpful to have an optimal strategy, but if it is not politically feasible um, and is not actually able to be implemented, um, this is something that could potentially inhibit uh, Moreover, especially the, the um, development of new variants um, appears largely driven by some of the, the poor countries with less access to vaccines. So understanding some of the political and economic factors that might make vaccination in these areas a reality um, will be very important towards preventing future outbreaks and mutations. So that is uh, where we're at right now. We're hoping to do some more research over the coming months. So if anyone has any comments or questions, um, here are our email addresses. And unless uh, Dr. Wagner has anything to conclude on, we're happy to open the floor now.